Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome on behalf of uh, IIC and Jan Prasad to this very interesting discussion where we open up the Kuwait evacuation of 1990 and the contemporary narrative. Uh, we have a very distinguished uh, panel and uh, uh, this, uh, in fact, uh, the speakers today were hands-on, uh, you know, organized this, this Kuwait evacuation. And uh, I hope this, uh, the, the immediate fallout of this would be that some of the speakers today are, uh, uh, you know, get a royal salute after so many years from us, of course, and from the government and uh, are given a Padma award. I mean, you know, this is ridiculous that they have not been honored uh, all these years for having rescued uh, 1,70,000 of our citizens from uh, uh, utter uh, uh, trauma, chaos, and disaster, you know, even death. Uh, at the hands of uh, Maraduas or whatever you must say uh, in uh, on that uh, foreign soil. So, uh, um, um, I mean, with your with your consent, uh, probably we should push for this in our own small humble ways, so that they are uh, given recognition. You know, uh, when recognition can for uh, uh, for Ambedkar and Bose could wait for 50 years, I think this is not very wrong then. So uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Sri Kamal Bakshi, who was the former ambassador in Iraq. And then uh, we have uh, uh, K.P. Fabian, who was the Joint Secretary Gulf. We have R.P. Singh, who was the Deputy Chief of Mission in Kuwait. And then, of course, we have Ratan Segal, who was Joint Secretary Personnel. And as we were discussing over tea just now, just before the meeting began, uh, a real hands-on group. And I'm really, uh, I mean, they still have that, that uh, you know, the, the vigor and the gusto which managed everything. You know, to begin with, uh, what we'll do is, uh, uh, you see, the, the, um, uh, why, this, uh, why this contemporary narrative? I mean, we of course all know there's, this been, there's been this uh, Bollywood uh, film called Airlift. Uh, yeah, the film is very nice, is it? Yeah, okay. So this uh, this meeting is all about the distortions that film has done, and uh, the fi the fiction it has uh, created, and the cinematic license it has taken in distorting everything. And uh, what all my friends here and my senior colleagues have done in rescuing our citizens. So now uh, we have uh, uh, three voices which will tell us a story from their end. Now they of course could come with us, be here today. There is first S.M. Mathur who was uh, our second secretary in Kuwait at that point. This uh, recent film uh, Airlift, I understand that you were quite distressed uh, on seeing the film and uh, that uh, you felt that there was so much distortion in the film and the role which uh, MEA and the officers posted in Kuwait played to rescue the Indians settled in Kuwait. Yeah, actually I learned about this movie when shooting took place near my hometown, Jodhpur. I saw the coverage in media in which they were mentioning that this entire evacuation uh, was uh, done by one man. So I was uh, naturally uh, unhappy about it. I tried to contact those people, but uh, there was no response. Later on, when I saw the movie, I saw that uh, so many facts have been totally distorted. For example, they have shown that all embassy personnel had left Kuwait. Well, it was not so. In fact, only diplomats had shifted to Basra, while non-diplomats continued to stay in Kuwait and uh, helping the Indians there. And uh, then the picture shows that the hero talks over telephone 
some officer in the Ministry of External Affairs. Now, it was not possible to make any contact from Kuwait on telephone as all the telephone lines had been snapped on the 2nd August itself. And uh, thereafter, the picture goes on to show that the Minister of External Affairs was indifferent to this problem and in one particular scene, he is telling a joint secretary that Kuwait is not our priority. This is absolutely false because external affairs minister, Mr. Gujral, had himself visited Baghdad first and then he came down to Kuwait. He assured the Indian community there that government of India will make all arrangements for their evacuation. He even told them that the expenditure on their air journey will also be borne by the government of India. And later on, the film goes on to show a scene in Baghdad where the ambassador pleaded his helplessness in issuing travel documents. While actually the Indian embassy continued to function in Kuwait till December and we had been issuing identity and travel documents to all the Indians who didn't have their passports. And then the film shows this man leading the entire convoy to Jordan. How was that possible when they didn't have any travel documents? So almost the entire story about this uh, character of the hero is imaginative and is, uh, is rather distorting the real work which was done by the officials of the government of India. I believe that you took up the matter with the external affairs ministry and uh, uh, what was the response? Yeah, you see, and initially my reaction was based only on whatever I saw on websites where they used to say that this entire evacuation has been done by one man. But later on, when they released the trailer of the movie and I saw some scenes, then on uh, 12th January, I mean 10 days before the release of the movie, I sent an email letter to JS Gulf in which I pointed out that these distortions are being shown in the movie and I requested them to take whatever action they deem necessary so that the image of Ministry of External Affairs and Government of India is not tarnished. Can we have a second? Uh, uh, this is Captain Kekoba. That's a very short uh, brief. Uh, yes. Uh, by the way, when uh, S.M. Mathur wrote to the JS Gulf, he received no reply. With the help of the Navy, we were able to fly 400 life jackets to Kuwait, which was eventually placed on board on the 3rd of September. The master and the crew also used a great deal of initiative in procuring few more life jackets and 14 life rafts locally from Kuwait. This helped our cause and then the master was taking instructions from me we were sending messages to the uh, to NEA New Delhi to the Indian Embassy, and the master was told to prepare for this evacuation. Captain Jule, who was the master, he made every effort over there to get uh, a list prepared of the 722 nationals with the uh, in consultation with the Indian community, and all these people boarded the vessel on fourth uh, of September. Being a general cargo ship, it was, you know, most of the people were spread around on the decks and in the, in the twin decks. The vessel reached Dubai on the 6th in the evening and docked in the morning on the 7th in, in, at Dubai. Within four hours, all the passengers were disembarked. My uh, late colleague, uh, Captain Modak, and myself had arranged a lot of food packets, water, etc. to be delivered to every passenger who disembarked. All the documentation was done on board by the judiciousness of the master and the crew. 
people cleared out very quickly. They were put onto the buses and taken to the airport. From the airport, they were flown down to Bombay and reunited with their families. It was a great humanitarian mission. It was a blessing for all of us. And we are indeed grateful to the Lord that everything happened well. All is well that ended well. Thank you. Uh, now, I just wanted a clarification because there has been this recent Bollywood film where, uh, you know, a ship captain is seen asking for money to get the Indian nationals out from Kuwait. And I believe that, uh, in fact, I have a letter uh, from uh, KP Fabian, then Joint Secretary Gulf, thanking you for this great national service. And uh, you um, uh, did not even accept a penny from uh, anybody for doing this national service. That is absolutely correct. Neither the government of India paid us anything, nor any a single passenger on board paid anything. In fact, the master and the crew helped all the passengers out with food, etc. Never asked a penny, took care so well. There were two children under the age of four months. And the master ensured the comfort of all the ladies, etc., who were in need. And everything was done very well. And my saloon department worked 48 hours non-stop to provide a meal of khichdi for all the passengers. You can understand with just few saloon crew to have a meal for 700 and odd passengers is quite an achievement. I think everyone has done a good job. It was great teamwork. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Captain uh, Kikobad, it's may been many years, but we even today salute you for this great national service you did in saving 722 Indian nationals stranded in Kuwait. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Borker. It was all of us, it, our joint efforts which made this possible, and we are living with their blessings. Last, uh recording we have is of Upinder Guman, who was stuck up in Kuwait and just had landed on the 2nd from London. Just to let you know that we reached on the 2nd of August 1990 and Kuwait was invaded by Iraq. And I've been a witness to it at the airport, the Transit Airport Hotel. So 19 days we stayed put there until our external affair minister, I.K. Kuchal, and Joint Secretary, Mr. K.P. Fabian arrived at the hotel in Kuwait. I remember the Joint Secretary at that moment asked us, um, he, Mr. Fabian said to us that, you know, the first thing um, external affairs minister I.K. Gujral wanted to know that who, which are the ladies who are traveling alone with children, the pregnant women, all come forward, please put your names down. And we were taken great care right up to reaching Baghdad, and then brought home back by Captain A.S. Gill. Recently, this film has been made by Bollywood called Airlift. Now, do you think um, uh, it distorts uh, uh, reality? And you, since you were a witness to what happened, uh, what do you think about it? Well, honestly speaking, yes, it has. But let me come back to you while I was in Kuwait at that moment at the Transit Hotel at the airport, where we were treated. We didn't have food to eat. No clothes to change. Believe me, those 18 days inside that hotel, we I did try to approach the ambassador then in, based in Kuwait. I remember having a conversation with him because the fellow passenger said to me, Ma'am, can you please speak? You know, I think he's a Punjabi. I think he's a Hindu. Will you please do? I'm a Sikh. Okay? So I did speak to him, and the reply I got from him at that moment was, you are under a roof, so be where you are. Be thankful you're fine enough. We cannot help you. Okay, just be there. That's all. I said, sir, we have no clothes. We have no food. We don't have the drop room. We are scared for our lives. We have the soldiers all the time outside our door. We, we are very scared of them. He was of no help to us. He just put the phone down. After, again, after a few hours, I tried him. He refused to take my call. He says, please don't trouble me. This is the reply I got from our ambassador, from our embassy there in Kuwait. But the moment it was Aike Guchal who came down, I had no no idea who was coming or what it was. But the moment Aike Guchal came in, our external affairs minister, 
it was like a, it was a sunshine for us honestly speaking we had life in us and to in this movie it saddens us that they have really spoiled our embassy name completely for the external affairs ministry it is very wrong what they have done to talk about mr ik gujral and to portray him the way they have done in this movie is very very wrong and i'm amazed and surprised that none of our government has spoken about it so can we now uh, uh, have the first speaker and that's our uh, then ambassador in baghdad shri kamal bakshi you have 10 minutes sir thank you mr boker i was india's ambassador to iraq for five and a half years mm-hmm. 1985 to the beginning of 1991 second of august 1990 saddam hussein marches into kuwait takes over kuwait and i must admit most of us diplomats were taken by surprise and uh, we were still examining the implications of this takeover military takeover by saddam hussein and particularly the fate of our 172000 indians in iraq and kuwait uh when a group of five or six indian pilgrims came to see me that must have been on the 4th or the 5th of august they said there were 300 indian pilgrims who had been to uh hajj there were shias so they had come to for pilgrimage to the sites in iraq uh which the shias cherish najaf karbala and so on they had returned tickets to to india by air india but there were no flights not inside iraq not outside not out or in and so on so uh, they asked us for help uh we looked we examined it and found that they could not go to saudi arabia they couldn't go to iran they couldn't go to turkey they couldn't go to syria the only country they could go to was jordan but there's no uh direct route uh trains or bus services from baghdad to oman so we we thought we'll hire buses from baghdad impossible because there were uh, tens of thousands of egyptians and palestinians who were also there and wanted to go back to their countries so we didn't know what to do till i and we didn't have any contact with delhi no telephones uh, no telexes we didn't have a, a, a wireless Uh, we didn't we didn't have any contacts even with our neighboring countries luckily i uh, got hold of our ambassador in amman and i asked him if he could send six empty buses from amman to baghdad uh 900 kilometers so he said who will pay i said we will pay he said we have no sanction i said on me you are doing this at my request my responsibility you hire six buses and send them to baghdad so the next two three days we received these six buses from amman and we had these pilgrims 300 of them sent to amman with some difficulty uh the the buses got delayed and so on and so forth so we sat all night and i remember my wife and uh, others cooked for these 300 people and this was the first repatriation evacuation of indians from baghdad to amman uh that established a template which we used as we went along uh a few days later our foreign minister mr gujral came to baghdad he met saddam hussein he asked saddam hussein for help in repatriating our people saddam assured complete cooperation 
Then he went to Kuwait and he took me along. And apart from other things which uh, Mr. R.P. Singh and Mr. Fabian would tell you, he addressed a large gathering of Indian nationals. And he said, Iraq has taken over Kuwait. The Iraqis say Kuwait is not an independent country any longer. Kuwait is a part of Iraq, so there should be no embassies in Kuwait, embassies only from, for, uh, in Iraq. And he called me onto the stage, and he said, this is Ambassador Kamal Bakshi. I have brought him along. Those of you who want to leave Kuwait, go to him for help. He'll help you to come back to India. Now, those were my orders given in public verbally. I came back to Baghdad and we started thinking how, why, where, and so on and so forth. Within a couple of days, I woke up. I, I, my residence was next to the embassy, the chancery. I woke up to find five to six hundred of our nationals outside my door. And I had no clue what to do. I had no idea where I can keep these people, where, where I can find accommodation for them. How can I feed them? And how would I, I know how to send them to Amman, but how, how do I organize all this? So then I thought maybe we can give them a daily allowance. So we decided that we'll give each one of them the equivalent of five dollars in Iraqi dinars for every day that they spend in Baghdad. So we said, look, I, I remember addressing these people with a, a microphone, a <laughs> portable microphone, and uh, uh, a loud hailer. And I said, look, uh, uh, I know you are in great difficulty, and I know that uh, you want to go back home immediately. We tried to help them. But please understand that we have problems. We don't have accommodation for you. But please come here, this side, and you know we'll give you X amount of money. You marry as you carry on for today, and we'll see what happens. Then we discovered a second and even bigger problem. Most of them didn't have any passports, because this is a tradition even in today that uh, the workers' passports are taken over by the employers. The employers had left Kuwait, and they had no passports. So we said, look, OK, we, you, those who have passports, we'll give them the money, enter on their passports now. The others get in a line, and we'll give you, you know, temporary passports, emergency passports, as we call them. Again, we went back to the embassy in <coughs> Amman. Again, we got some buses. We put them on the buses, and they went to Amman, where there were commercial flights. And uh, they were put on to these flights after delay, after waits. Um, uh, Mr. Ratan Seigel has greater experience of what happened on the other side. He'll tell you that. But I want to emphasize the, um, the, 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 the dimensions of the problem that we had. 172,000 Indian nationals in Kuwait and in Iraq, 30,000 of them in Iraq, 142,000 of them in Kuwait. 900 kilometers from Baghdad to uh, Amman, 350 kilometers from Baghdad to Basra, 165 kilometers from Basra to uh, Kuwait city, a total of over 900 kilometers. It was summer. It was Iraqi summer. It doesn't rain. It was very, very hot. And we had no space to really keep these people and so on. So we worked on this template as people kept on coming. And peop these people were running in panic. These people were not the rich people. These people were not the white collar people, these people were workers, you know, uh, maids, for example, and 
carpenters and, and plumbers and all, all, all workers who were running away in panic. Uh, eventually, we, uh, with the help of the Iraqis, we were able to set up a, a camp, transit camp and so on. So this is we kept on doing, issuing them uh, past temporary uh, uh, emergency passports to those who didn't have them. Um, and there was no time to check. You know, you asked questions like, where do you come from? What's the name of the city? Who's your MLA? Things like that. And tough passport. We ran out of all our emergency certificates or passports. So we started photocopying them. Then we started cyclosiling them, and so on and so forth. And sometimes we'll get in contact, we used to get into contact with, the, with, with, with Amman, sometimes we did not. No contact with Kuwait, and so on. That's how we went on for uh, all these months. Uh, I must admit, the, the embassy, uh, in, 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 in Kuwait had to shift to, to, to uh, Basra because that's what the Iraqis told us. The officers came but the staff remained there and my friend uh, Master Eki Budhi Raja remained in Basra all this while along with Mr. R.P. Singh and others and these people used to go every other day to Kuwait uh, with the instructions from Mr. Budhi Raja to help these people come uh, to Baghdad and so on. And there was, in, in Amman, as Ratan would say, I'll tell you later, there were problems because we were, there was no coordination. We were not, we, were, we had no communications and so on. So there were lots of people in Amman who were waiting for uh, flights and there were no flights. But eventually, uh, two things happened. One that there was coordination in Delhi between um, Mr. Fabian of our Ministry of uh, Civil Aviation, Air India and so on, and the number of Air India flights increased. Uh, eventually there were 10 flights a day. Correct me if I'm wrong, Ratan. And then eventually the United Nations got into the act and we had United Nations flight. So all this was possible basically because of the visit of Mr. Gujral and his cooperation that he got from the Iraqis, the coordination that the government of India had here in Delhi, the coordination due, to, I mean, very imperfect coordination between Kuwait, Baghdad and Amman and the help that we got from the community in, uh, in, in Baghdad and in Kuwait. So, I'll conclude by saying that we carried on this, first hiring buses from Amman, then hiring buses from Baghdad, then eventually, once it got organized, buses used to start from Kuwait and go straight to uh, Amman with whatever help we could give at Baghdad. That's how it happened. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ambassador Bakshi. Now over to R.P. Singh who was uh, then our Deputy Chief of Mission in Kuwait. As uh, Ambassador Baxi has mentioned already, the uh, Iraqi soldiers entered Kuwait at about 1 o'clock on 2nd August 1990. Within a uh, few hours, they looted Kuwait city, whose shops, jewelry shops, and other things by six or seven o'clock early morning, they were looted and taken to Baghdad. Well, we came to know about the invasion at about two thirty-three o'clock. And uh, Ambassador Budhi Raza informed J.S. Gulf at that time, Ambassador Fabian. At uh, the time in India was about 6.30, I think. 
At that time, the international telephone lines were working, but again within a couple of hours, the international telephone lines and the electricity were cut off. And therefore, we were absolutely out of touch with the ministry for a week. Of course, we were uh, important uh, communications we were sending through Baghdad, through our ambassador in Baghdad, and also the response used to be received from the ministry through Baghdad. On 5th or 6th of August, the Iraqi government issued a notification. They notified that the since uh, Kuwait is 19th province of Iraq, all the embassies will have to wound up, will, will have to wind up and uh, go away. And uh, if they, they, they didn't obey the instructions, then their water and electricity will completely be shut off. And then comes Mr. Guzral, our external affairs minister, accompanied by Ambassador Baxi, Mr. Ambassador K.P. Fabian, Ambassador I.B. Khosla. And we had a meeting with the, in the embassy to decide for the course of action because the decision of the Iraqi government was that our all diplomatic staff will move to Basra, including the ambassador. And because we had requested uh, Saddam Hussein, in fact, minister had requested uh, when he met him in Baghdad, that we have a large Indian community there, more than 170,000 people, and therefore uh, we cannot just repatriate them by 23rd of August. And hence we need extension of time a couple of months. But this request was not agreed to, it was rejected. But we were allowed to function from Basra and keep our separate identity. While the Iraqis had said that we, you can join your consulate in Basra, because we had a consul, consulate, we had a consul general. But we refused to that under the instructions of the Ministry of External Affairs that if you become part of our consulate, which means we, we have uh, recognized the invasion on Kuwait, and Kuwait, according to us, India, was a sovereign country still then. And therefore, we said that, well, we will keep our identity separate, and we opened our office in Seraton Hotel in Basra, where along with the ambassador, all diplomatic staff moved there. And then from that date, that is, that was on 23rd August. And from 24th August, we started going, the diplomatic uh, officers, two officers and one or two staff, that is the diplomatic staff, they attach each level. We started going to Kuwait to help our community there and our staff, non-diplomatic staff, to prepare the travel documents. Let me tell you that on, on that particular day, the 2nd August, roughly we had about 150,000 Indians because 20,000 people had gone on summer vacation because the schools were closed. Out of 150,000, 120,000 didn't have travel documents. About 20,000 were those who were, you know, working in the, in 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 government, Kuwaiti government, or petroleum companies and other business establishments. So they had their passports and travel documents, but 120 were those who didn't have anything, and it was difficult for us, as Ambassador Baxi has mentioned, it was difficult for us how to prepare 
that that number of travel documents but anyway there are uh, there are instructions on the subject that uh, in case of such eventuality in case of emergencies the embassy can issue the uh, uh, the, the the emergency certificates which which means you can land in india with that certificate and after that it doesn't have its validity so we started issuing the emergency certificates to the the people or our people there but then th there was a very uh, uh, peculiar situation everybody out of that 120000 wanted to go immediately and they were blaming the government like anything i'll be honest embassy as well as the government but with the help of indian community and by that time uh, um, mr ratan sagal had also come there we had uh, discussed this matter with the indian community there and uh, then we we asked them that let us plan the evacuation in a proper manner then few people they they came to us in basra also met the ambassador met ambassador puddi raja and uh, he guided them that how to do it and from that day that is that was early september first week of september uh, that we formed some committees there with the help of indian community leaders and let me tell you those leaders were i can name them one was sunny matthews who was president of indian art circle there though there were there were about 60 i remember 62 associations indian communities association and uh, they had their different opinion and because everybody wanted to send their associations uh, people first but then it was difficult for us to how to uh, uh, you know make a priority list but then with the help of uh, the indian community leaders we made the uh, three four committees evacuation committee food committee then the relief committee and transport committee uh, for sending them by buses we the indian uh, community there they collected the 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 uh, amount from those who could who could afford and therefore uh, uh, after collection a lot of collections because some people they really donated lot of money for this good cause and let me tell you at end of the uh, uh, evacuation we were left with a huge amount of money which was deposited in a bank by ambassador puddi raza and myself and it was then given to the prime minister's relief fund and that's on record that's record in the ministry and uh, so we started sending every day 50 to 100 buses three to four thousand people every day and on the way they will have a little break in baghdad where ambassador baksi and his team were looking after them giving them food water and all kind of blankets etc etc so it was it was a uh, uh, huge evacuation now when we talk of this film they say that embassy people they ran away from kuwait but we were still there and we were there right up to 8th of january 1991 and at that time we had meeting with various people saying that well war is imminent and therefore you should go from here and evacuation is going on so 7 8000 people that were mainly the maids drivers uh, and and some nurses they said the well of we, if we have to die we will better die here we don't want to go back to india because we have lot of debts and we will die in any case there also therefore they stay there the government of india decided to wind up the embassy and they ask us also to come back uh, on 10th of january 
I, along with the, a team of eight officers, we came back and reached Delhi on 15th of January, a day before the war. Of course, our consular, Mr. Mokhija, uh, and uh, the consul, uh, the uh, people from the consulate, they came after a couple of days. But they came via Cyprus, a different route, because 16th of January, the war was declared and then the airspace was closed for even for Jordan and Baghdad and they had to come via Cyprus reaching Delhi after a couple of days of the war. It is, it is, it is unfortunate that the, in the, the picture has given some kind of impression to our general masses that is Indians who have seen the picture that government of India didn't do anything. The embassies in Kuwait, Baghdad and Amman didn't do anything, which is absolutely wrong. Because whatever the embassy of India in Kuwait could do, they, they did day and night. I remember we didn't sleep more than two hours at night. And we, when we traveled from Basra to Baghdad, sorry, uh, uh, Kuwait, uh, on the way there were mines. And there are always risk of your life. And therefore, uh, going to Kuwait, coming back to Basra every day or second day, it was, it was a very difficult task. But we did it. And we, we did it for the sake of our Indian community in Kuwait. And we are proud that we could send all the Indians who wanted to come from there, we sent them and in a planned way. The, how the priority list was prepared. We made, you know, some priority. First was the uh, advanced phase, uh, pregnancy of, uh, of uh, ladies. Then the sick people, whether it was women or uh, gents. Then we had handicapped people. Then we had the students of 12th and 10th classes whose examinations were in March, it was just, you know, just, just, uh, you know, a couple of months away. And uh, so that is how we sent. Now, evacuation started on, 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 in fact, when Mr. Guzral went there, we could send about 200 people in his flight. Then in the first week of September, we sent about, uh, I think, 700 plus by, by, by sea, by ship, Indian ship Safir. And then after that, of course, by buses, by road, and the distance from Kuwait to the Jordan was 1,900 kilometers going by buses. And 75 kilometers was no man land, which was a dangerous area, and it was difficult to cross no man land. It, uh, not, it was not that easy. But we did it. Our diplomats and the staff, even from Kuwait, they went to Jordan, they helped our embassy there in various camps. There was not one camp, there are a number of camps. And we were, uh, well, well, I, I just want to say that uh, in the beginning itself, it was said that there cannot be two ambassadors in Iraq because Kuwait is part and parcel of Iraq and therefore Ambassador Puddi Raja has to go. But somehow, ministry was also liberal and uh, Ambassador Pudi Raza stayed in Basra, guiding us on almost on daily basis. Whenever we went to Kuwait, when we came back from Kuwait, we gave him briefing and got his ad uh, you know, advice and guidance from time to time. He left on 3rd of November 1990. Uh, and by that time, unfortunately, he was not well, but still his, his contribution was a lot. Unfortunately, he's not, has not, his name has not been mentioned anywhere, but I, I must say that uh, he played a very, very important role in guiding us, guiding the Indian community in Kuwait, and uh, because the, those people were, you know, crossing, uh, you know, via Basra, and uh, getting his advice and uh, on, on various matters. It was, it was, uh, a, a, a very difficult time for us, but we came with great success 
thanks to government of India and our embassies in, in, in Baghdad and Amman also. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Ambassador R.P. Singh. I think these moments, uh, you know, he went, I think uh, it was going through that trauma again. You know? I mean, I could uh, see that emotion. But thank you very much, and we salute the kind of work you all did. So now I would request uh, Sri Ratan Sagal, uh, then uh, Joint Secretary Personnel in MEA, to take the floor. You know, I was watching these snippets of the criticism against the government and the ministry and so on, I also looked at my file of newspaper clippings from that period and I find for almost 25 days the criticism in the media was far more than anything that has been shown today. Right from Gujral's famous flight in which he brought the money bags out of Kuwait to hammering the ambassador in Amman for not being able to arrange it planes and accommodation and so on. I mean, there's no end to the criticism that was there. But what was the choice for us? We had small embassies with very limited staff. I mean, Amman had an ambassador and a first secretary and some uh, staff. How, did, how could they provide the resources and money and everything else which most of the Indians who came from Kuwait demanded. The situation was so bad at one stage that the ambassador in Amman sent a telex to headquarters saying he was totally unindated by the influx from Kuwait. He had over 4,000 Kuwaiti or Indian Kuwaitis sitting in Amman. He had almost 10,000 sitting in no man's land whom the, uh, the Jordanians were not allowing in. The situation was really awful. Mr. Gujral, when he arrived there, he was, people complained to him, he ordered the setting up of community kitchens, and he said, fine, you hired the accommodation and so on, but where was the accommodation to come from? Now, he sent this very depressing uh, uh, telex message in which he pointed out that you know, he couldn't even, even enter his own office because of the large number of Indians who were squatting on every inch of the chancery. Now, at that stage, I was asked to go there and make an assessment and to report to government. I arrived in Amman on the 16th of August. I drove straight to the embassy. As I, within a kilometer of the embassy, I found hordes of Indians occupying every park, garden, footpath, roads. It didn't matter. They had spread their whole dolls and bedrolls and so on, and ladies had put their saris over bushes, and they're taking, because it was hot. It was really hot at peak summer. When I arrived at the chancery, I couldn't enter the chancery. There were so many people, so many people. Anyways. I got the ambassador who, because he could not enter his chancery, he was operating from home. I got him to come to the chancery, and next day we went around to look at all the refugee camps and so on, and it was a very depressing sight. We would organize accommodation, or at least the embassy was organizing accommodation for 2,000 people. Next day he'd have 5,000 on his hand. Accommodation was not easily available. Food, the resources were just not there. Anyways, I went round and I sent a, a telegram in which I mentioned that all these people had fled in panic. There was no way that we could provide the facilities that were required. They were undergoing enormous amount of hardship. Their whole experience in the no man's land, it's all desert, no shelter, no food. Gadinder Singh, the ambassador, sent trucks with food and water. They were looted by other, of other nationalities. So when we went to no man's land, etc., we came back and I, I said in my, in my report to the ministry, I said, there's no way we can handle this kind of unorganized influx into Oman. We have to organize the evacuation in Kuwait itself and have it come in a manageable, in a, in a manageable way so that we could 
make provision for those people. Anyways, I had been sent to Amman for two days, and I got a call from the Foreign Secretary to say, Mr. V.P. Singh, the Prime Minister has liked your report. He thinks you are on the right track, so you are to stay on and organize the evacuation. So I protested, you know. I said, I came with clothes, etc., for two days. How can I just stay on? And, you know, we had no idea how the thing would actually play out. So I, um, he said, no, the Prime Minister is very keen. So start the evacuation, and then we'll see. So I flew to Baghdad, met Kamal Bakshi, and then we flew down to Basra, where we met Arun Bodhiraja, who was the ambassador camping there. And we discussed this matter of the organized evacuation. Kamal felt it was feasible. Arun said, listen, I know those people. The different communities will fight with, with each other. It will be very difficult to get them together. Anyways, what he did was to ring up Kuwait and get many of the Indian leaders to come to Basra to meet me. I met them, 12, 12, 13 of them came. We had a long discussion on how to organize the evacuation. I mean, I told them, take notes, but you know, they were businessmen. Most of them were just businessmen who had no clue. This was to be like a military operation. So I, uh, after briefing them thoroughly, you know, one of the things that was done before the embassy moved out to Basra, some Indians had come and installed a ham radio in the embassy premises. And that gave us the link to South Block. And so I told them, I said, listen, you get your act together and then start sending messages to me. We will receive them and then we will organize things. They had no control. The buses wouldn't stop. We, we said, you must have 70 buses with 2,000 people per day. That's the maximum that we can handle. No such thing. 120 buses, 130 buses, cars coming along. I mean, total panic. At that stage, I told the government, I said, look, if you want me to continue on here and handle this evacuation, then you have to give me a designation by which I can talk to people to talk to the three gov oh, two governments involved, Jordan and uh, uh, Iraq. So I was appointed as chief coordinator for evacuation. One of the first things I did was to attend a meeting in the office of Prince Hassan, then the Prime Minister of Jordan. He had a meeting of all the, all the countries whose citizens were involved in this movement. And there we requested if a camp could be set up for us somewhere close to Amman, with you know, provisions for food, water, and so on. And uh, we would bring our evacuees to that camp. The other thing we did, because Fabian knows this, he had arrived while I was sitting in Baghdad and Basra. He had come there with Minister Uni Krishnan, who was then Minister for Surface Transport. And Mr. Uni Krishnan saw the situation he was not very happy with our ambassador. But the fact of the matter was that when he went back, he said we needed the aircraft. Till then, we had odd aircrafts of Air India, which they could spare. The government was not agreeing to their giving up their lucrative routes and so on. And they would send the odd 707 and so on, and right from the early days of the evacuation. But that was not sufficient. And then after Mr. Uni Krishnan's visit, we got all those A320s which had been grounded in Bombay and Delhi and so on. We got those aircrafts coming into Amman. Now, they were small with limited uh, range, but still we could remove 100, 120 people at a time in those aircrafts. And, you know, it was re really like a conveyor belt, what they talk of this airlift. It was just that. The aircrafts kept coming in, we kept loading them up, but the movement out of Kuwait was unrelenting and as unorganized as day one. At that stage, I requested the ministry that get me permission to go into Kuwait and I will talk to the Indian community there. Well, they called in the Iraqi ambassador and talked to him, and Kamal Bakshi went to the foreign office and talked to them. Eventually, they gave us permission. And I arrived in Baghdad, 
Kamal came with me to Basra, and we were to go by car the next day to Kuwait. And we arrived at the border, Safwan. And the guard said, sorry, permission has been withdrawn. So we came back to Basra and went and met the governor and explained to the governor that we have no other aim there except to talk to the Indian community to organize themselves to come out in an organized fashion. This would help everybody. Well, strangely enough, he agreed. The next day, I was called in the morning and told you can go into Kuwait. So we went in. I met the leaders of the Indian community at the school. RP's people were there doing all the counselor services and so on. And I sat for hours with those leaders of the Indian community, Toyota, Matthews, Vedi, all these people who are talked about, and explained how we need to do this. They promised, they took notes, they did everything. They promised that they would organize the movement. 70 buses, 2,000 people every day, no more. So three days later, we got a message from the ham radio to say that the first convoy is coming in. I was there with the entire support teams that I had. You know, a lot of people were given to me from different embassies, from the ministry, uh, IS officers from Kerala. All of them were there with me. And we arrived, and the first buses started coming in. I've got photographs of those. And we were overjoyed, thought, now we've got the thing under control. And then the buses kept coming, and the buses kept coming. They wouldn't stop. We said, what happened? 130 buses. And while our organized buses had only 2,000 people, these, there was no control. 30 people, 40 people in a bus. We didn't have buses to transform, uh, transfer them from the border to the camp. We had to take the first lot of people to the camp, come back to take the... We spent the whole night there trying to organize this. And, you know, many of them were very rich people who, who, who were so used to their, their own uh, superior ways. They were expecting us to work as porters to get out their baggage and so on. And, I mean, it was, it was really an abysmal situation. I took a lot of notes. Those notes are still with me eh, in my diaries. I came back to the embassy, prepared a telex which was sent to, De to Delhi to pass on to the Indian community in Kuwait. Long notes, please do this, do this, do this. They sent an apology saying that, sorry, but people joined the convoy when our official convoy is on its way. They just joined them on the way. Yeah. We had no control over them. Anyways, for the next four or five days, it was harrowing, to say the least. None of us got any sleep. And I do remember several officers coming to me and saying, sir, we can't take any more of this. Every day, we were there for 12 hours at the border trying to transship these people. And so it was really, it's amazing how these youngsters work so beautifully here. By the end of August, suddenly those people saw sense because we were sending in every message, listen, we will take every single Indian out of Kuwait. Do not panic. Do not uh, uh, jump the queue. Everybody will register with the, with the, uh, in the, the Indian school. You know, I, I, I spent three months <laughs> doing this evacuation, and I've not even gone quarter of the way through. That's why I, I just kept <laughs> Three months, I went, I went there for two days and came back after three months. <laughs> no, I can't. I, I can. That's why I kept quiet. It's so emotionally sad. <laughs> you, know? you know, they responded, and by the fifth day, we had 70 buses, 2,000 people. We had 70 buses waiting at the border to transfer them to the camp. The time lag between their arrival in the camp and their departure was four days. By the middle of September, we had reduced it to three days. And by the end of September, we had reduced it to one day. On one of my visits to the camp, people complained to me. They said, look, we thought we'll have a picnic here. And you are now, we've just arrived and you're pushing us out here. I said, I need the space. I would love to keep you here, but I need the space. Now, you know, at that time, one of our biggest obstacles was the aircrafts. The A320s were not large enough. 
the capacity was limited, the range was limited. Air India then, on orders of the government, because Air India couldn't do it on its own, pulled the aircrafts out from whatever routes they could and so on, and suddenly we had this air bridge between Delhi and Amman, because now they were bringing in the jumbos, it's not the little aircrafts there. Okay, we reduced it to one day. And Air India, I must say, was very responsive. They had their officers there. They would uh, prepare individual tickets. I found this was causing enormous delay. So I told Michael Mascarenas, who was the regional director in, in, in Dubai, I said, listen, Mike, this won't do. I'm going to give you a sheet of paper with all the names. You attach it to one ticket. He said, no, I utter rules. We have to have a ticket for everyone. I said, these are not your planes. These are my planes. We have chartered them from you. And we are going to give you one sheet of paper with one ticket. So we had a team at the camp. They would prepare the daily list, summon all the chaps from the tent, put them in a bus, take them to the aircraft, and off they would go to India. Our evacuation was going smoothly, but not so for other nationalities. One day I got a call from, the, from Geneva, from the IOM. I didn't even know what IOM was, till the gentleman explained it's the International Organization for Migration. And he said, you know, we are having immense problems trying to evacuate the Nepalese, the Sri Lankans, the Filipinos, and other nationalities. You are having a very, very smooth evacuation. I said, yes, it is smooth now. You don't know what we went through. He said, we want to come and meet you to discuss how you're doing this. Okay? They came to Amman the next day. I explained to them all that we were doing. And they liked this one about the sheet with the ticket, with single ticket, no individual, no individual tickets. It became very amusing because they had a smaller numbers to deal with. We had 160,000 people to deal with. They were dealing with small numbers, 20, 30,000. After a week, they suddenly found they had surplus aircrafts and no takers. So they offered them to me. I was only too happy to take them. So we were evacuating our Indians in Air India aircrafts, the big jumbos. We had jumbos from Philippine Airlines and British Airways and all kinds of other airlines. And the numbers going out, so we reduced the time lag to exactly one day. So people came, had enough time to have a bath and have a meal, get into the bus and go to the airport on their way out. Now, this was one aspect of the evacuation. The other was, right from Prince Hassan, who had, after that meeting, when I had mentioned that I was, we were seeking permission to go into Kuwait, he spoke to me separately and said he had a very good German friend, a professor who was there in Kuwait in hiding. Could I get him out? I said, you give me his number, I'll talk to him. When I go to Kuwait, then we'll get him out. But I was also receiving calls from Bombay, from Delhi, from London, from all over, giving me names of people who were stuck there and whom we could get out. All right? I went to Kuwait. We, the telephone lines worked there. Spoke to these people, asked them to come to the school, told our, our counselor people, give them Indian papers. This German had a beard. We give him a kurta pajama, put a turban on his head, and put him in one of our buses. <laughs> we put any number of Kuwaitis into our, our, into our buses. We put British nationals, German nationals, all kinds of people. We, whoever wanted to come, we said, fine, you get into our buses. By that time, our buses, our convoys, became well known to the Iraqi guards at various uh, checkpoints and so on. So they would take the sheet of paper from us with the names and passport numbers, we have a song. No checking. We transferred all these people to India. Some of them in Amman pulled out their own original passports and left. Now, I just would like to finish it very brief. One day I was sitting in my, I had come back after three months, because by that time the number of evacuees had dwindled to 700, 800. There was no need for me and my teams to stay there. So we all came out, and the embassy took over control. 
I got back to Delhi, and one day the reception tells me, Sir, there are a whole lot of people from Kuwait who want to see you. Why do people from Kuwait want to see me? I thought they were Indians, but then they came and they were all uh, Kuwaitis. And they told me something which had not struck me at that time. They said, you brought us out on Indian papers. <laughs> we pulled out our Kuwaiti passports. They have no entry stamps into India. Now what do we do? How do we get out of this country? <laughs> now, this is a tricky problem. So I spoke to the foreign secretary, Mr. Mani Dixit, and I told him, I said, this is the problem we have. Mani says, I'll do something about it. Now, that time, J.S. Foreigners in the MHA was a very fine officer called Vinay Jha. So I rang up Vinay. I said, Vinay, I have committed a cardinal sin of bringing in foreigners on Indian papers. Now you have to connive with me. He said, what do you want? I said, I want stamps on those Kuwaiti passports. Tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock, I'll be there with the FRRO. Now, look, you are recording all this, but, you know, these are a lot of illegalities that we did. They were brought, stamped. In my office, all the passports were stamped. We wish them goodbye. And so it remained for two years. After two years, these are facts which I don't think uh, even Fabian knows. After two years, the foreign minister sent for me, and he said the crown prince of Kuwait was here. Why does he want you to come to Kuwait? I said, I haven't a clue. He discussed, he said, surely you must have some idea. I said, sir, I have no, no connection with Kuwait after I came out from there. He said, okay, let the matter rest. A week later, Chris Sinamasan, who was the Secretary East, called me. He said, the Iraqi ambassador, or oh, sorry, the Kuwait ambassador has been here, and he wants to know what is our decision about sending you to Kuwait there, as their state guest. So I stayed together, what? I have nothing to do with the Kuwaitis. So we went to see the foreign secretary. Foreign secretary discussed it. We went to see the minister. Mani said, let him go. What's the harm? We have any case such bad relations with Kuwait now. We might as well let him go. So I was told to go to Kuwait. Now I'm not going to go into detail because I don't think any of you will believe me at the kind of reception I got there. But the fact of the matter was that on the when I arrived there, I was told by the chief of protocol who had received me, along with all kinds of other dignitaries, that I was going to be the guest of the son-in-law of the crown prince, Sheikh Suleiman. So I said, look, I think you've got the wrong man. I mean, I, I'm a middle-ranking officer in the ministry. I don't associate with sheikhs and so on. He said, no, 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 Mr. Segal, we've got the right man. You'll know tomorrow, because Sheikh Suleiman is going off for the Umrah after he sees you to your hotel. And after that, he will be back tomorrow, and you'll be having lunch with him. So I go to his house for lunch the next day. You know, we had an ambassador called Prem Singh, who had just been sent there. And I had a long chat with Prem Singh, and I said, why do they want me? He said, I haven't a clue. I said, OK, will you send some people to receive me? So, when I was taken to my rest house, I rang up, or this guest house, I rang up Prem Singh, and I said, listen, I were, he said, my people are still waiting at the airport, and nobody knows your whereabouts, sir. So I said, look, this is what has happened. He said, I'm coming to see you. He came to see me. And we talked, and I said, look, I've been given a program. I have to call on the foreign minister tomorrow morning, and the home minister, and the defense minister. I said, what for? I don't know. I'm not a politician. I'm not a, somebody senior in the government that I can uh, talk to these people. He said, no, I have not even met the foreign minister yet. So you please insist on my accompanying you, OK? So that night at the dinner, which was hosted for me, I said, listen, no. That is country to country. Yours is a personal relationship. What personal relationship? I don't have anything to do with the Kuwaitis. So next day, after that meeting on the foreign minister and so on, I went to see Sheikh Suleiman at his house. And there was a lot of laughter amongst them, because I was still saying, I think you've got the wrong man here. <laughs> Sheikh Suleiman, in his limited English, said, no, no, you will understand now. And I was taken into the next room, big drawing room. And there I see a lot of familiar faces, all these little Kuwaitis, etc., who had come to my office for getting their passport stamped. 
And there I discovered that amongst the people we had evacuated was Sheikh Suleiman's mother, his sisters, his brothers, nephews, nieces, all kinds of people. And they said, you're the only one who helped us in this. Okay. Now, I came back and recorded a big long note on this and Mr. Dixit felt we could use this in improving our relations further with you know, I want to say one thing on this evacuation. We are getting all agitated on this movie and that silly remarks that they have made and so on. It was an incredible team effort. I was the official coordinator, but it was an incredible team effort. Three ambassadors involved. Arun Budhi Raja, Kamal Bakshi, Gajinder Singh. I had team of young officers, second secretaries, first secretaries, the senior most was a, a director from the establishment division of the of the MEA, who were with me, helping me. What an incredible job they did. Day and night they were working, getting tickets made, getting this done, this, this, that. And then Air India. Air India rose to the occasion. I had two people there, Manuel and Nair. I would give them the list and said, we need so many people, we need so many planes. And they responded. You know, it was an incredible team effort. And the credit goes to the people of India for this, not to anybody else. You know, when there's a crisis, we rise to the occasion. And in this case, we did. It was really an incredible effort by every single agency. And I've left out just uh, Gulf and his, and his team in, 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 uh, in uh, Delhi, who are only creating problems for me. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, they thank won't you. let me. They thank won't you. let me come back. They, every time I said I have to come back, they said no. You stay on. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Sri Ratan Sagar. I think uh, you know we've all been uh, witnesses to the recording of oral history today. You know, this is the first time the oral history of this has been recorded, and I think this uh, this should go into the archives. Definitely, it'll go into the archives of IIC. What, what I'm just saying is this should get into the you know into the into. Uh, the Nehru Memorial, the archives and all. I mean, this is a real oral history which which has been done, and thank you very much. Walker, the only, my only objection is that 26 years have passed before somebody thought in terms of having a seminar to discuss this. You know, we did all that in 1990. No seminar. The only thing I did was to brief the world press the day after I came back at the instance of Mr. Gujral so that we would get a good write-up. And thank you very much for all of you joining. Now I'll um, hand over the, 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 the floor to Ambassador Fabian. Ambassador Fabian. Thank you, Suhas. Uh, we are batchmates. And by now you know that he has been se keeping secrets away from me. <laughs> but you can see the fondness I have for him. Uh, J.S. Pers, J.S. Personnel in MEA, is privy to many, many secrets, which she or she I cannot reveal, share. I only reveal two secrets, <laughs> not, not more than Yeah, one. but uh, two in uh, how many years? <laughs> well, many years. <laughs> two secrets in 25, 26 years? Now. Ah, that's what I said. Okay, but thank you for that. Now, uh, my task is simple because uh, my colleagues, my good friends, uh, have, you know, narrated what happened and they have narrated it not only brilliantly, but also truthfully. So I don't have to add much. But I want to start with uh, the big picture. 2nd of August, the invasion took place. Now, it is wrong to think that on the 3rd of August, Government of India should have organized evacuation. No, it is wrong to think because there's no need. <laughs> Let me explain. When the invasion occurred, Actually, we had two concerns. One is the security and safety of our community there. And equally important, and linked with that, that uh, this should not sort of uh, escalate into a war. That was, you know, the two concerns that we had. So Foreign Minister Gujral went to the United States. He spoke to his... Uh, U.S. counterpart, Secretary General of the U.N. and others and others, but uh, he realized that there will be a war and that there was need to evacuate 
our people. There were also the human, uh, UN sanctions. So even if our people had remained there, they wouldn't have anything to eat. And don't forget, uh, and this is very important, the Iraqi army was not doing any harm to the Indian population. There was no need to evacuate our people just because Iraqi army had come in. That is one thing. Now, about Gujral, Master, but she told us about the big meeting he addressed. Now, I want to give you a little background. Is that when we landed up in Kuwait, uh, our ambassador, Budiraja, and let me add, very correctly, he told us, Sir, I mean, he told uh, uh, Minister Gujral, Sir, there are about 4,000, 5,000 of our people there. They are in some Maidan and uh, they are very angry. And uh, I wouldn't advise you to go there. Maybe you can send uh, IP Kosla and KP Fabian and uh, maybe Ambassador Bacchino, but I wouldn't advise you to go there. He is correct in the sense that, you know, as Ambassador, he was responsible for Mr. Gujral's safety and security. But then we discussed it with Gujral, and uh, he said, no, you're going there. We came to meet our people. And then these people were, you know, very angry. But let me tell you, within three to four minutes, uh, Mr. Gujral made them say Bharat Mada Ki Jai. Now, that is a politician at its best, the angry people. Another thing is that, you know, his embrace of uh, Saddam Hussein about as much has been made out. Yeah. Well, he went to meet Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein got up and came to embrace him. Now, can you tell him, listen, you are Saddam Hussein. I don't want to be embraced by you. <laughs> no, this is nonsense. Now, all this came because, and we have to understand this, our media were heavily under American influence. They believed all that the Americans said. Okay. Now, the second point I want to say is that uh, I got a phone call from our ambassador in Kuwait when it was about 3 to 3.30 Kuwaiti time, which shows that the ambassador in Kuwait was not sleeping, that he was alert. And throughout the period, you know, the embassy and the ambassador, they were very, very alert. Now, coming to another phone call, and this is important, I got another phone call. I got many, but that's not the point. Uh, is that uh, this was from a man called KTB Menon. KTB Menon was the richest Indian yeah. in Kuwait. And he called me from London. Incidentally, you heard uh, Pupinder Guman? Actually, both she and uh, KTB Menon were in London. And she was not getting a ticket to go to Kuwait. But KTB Menon, for some reason, cancelled his ticket, and that is how Pupinder was able to get to Kuwait. <laughs> now, question is, did KTB Menon know something which others did not know? Possible. He had his high connections. Anyway, but what he told me was, Fabian, you can evacuate all the Indians in Kuwait. It's about 170,000 if you put Kuwait and Iraq together. And uh, he said he does not make any distinction between those who were in Kuwait, those who were in Iraq. And these are his words. I will pay the entire amount. It was a blank check. So I thanked KTB. I said I might make use of it. But then I added, listen, as far as evacuation is concerned, once we decide on it, government definitely will take care of it because that is our rule. You know, it is our duty to evacuate our people who are in trouble. But KTV said it, and for me, you know, it was a very, very important uh, phone call. <laughs> now, the, we came back, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ratan has mentioned, you know, uh, how we went to Amman and all that, you know. Then, as soon as uh, Gujral came back, you know, and suddenly, that IL-76, there is a story that we, Gujral picked up all the Punjabis <laughs> in Kuwait and brought them. This is utter nonsense. He didn't do that. Uh, I had to prepare the list. And uh, I was at the embassy. I got assistance uh, from the embassy, though the embassy refused to give me any names because they said, you know, they had to continue to live there. So they didn't want anyone to think, you know, that they had not, you know, okay, understood. Yeah, understood, understood. 
then what happened was that uh, Gujral was sitting there and uh, you know some street smart people from Delhi and around will go to him and they will come to me later with their visiting card, three seats signed I.K. Gujral. Now I got the first two visiting cards, I told them, okay, fine, we will take care of you. When the third one came, I got worried and uh, I told him, well, let me see, I'll do my best. After all, the minister has signed it, I'll do my best, but I can't assure you, but I'll do my best and I'll give you a call. Well, as soon as he left me, I rushed to Mr. Gujral and, uh, sir, this won't do. What won't do? I said, we can't be taking healthy looking people and especially those who come from a particular part of India. So what do you want? I said, uh, we have to have it distributed. We want the Bengalis, we want the Gujaratis, we want the Malayalis, we want the Canaries. Okay, how do you want to do it? So I said, I'll call up uh, the associations and ask them to give names. He said, fine. Then uh, I, I asked him, but what about these people who are going to see you because there was a long queue? So he asked me, what shall I do? I said, uh, do one thing. You keep on signing, but it's understood between us that <laughs> they won't be taken. He said, fine. So he signed more, and we didn't, you know. So that was what I, But one among them who had got his signature was a man, a young man from uh, Bangalore. You know, when uh, at the hotel, uh, Holiday Inn, when I was reading out the names, his name was not there. He came and got hold of me, and then he said, you know, here is your minister's signature. And then he said, you won't leave my hand. You know, he was shaking hands with me, unless I took him. And I had to do a uh, play a trick, you know, as children, you know. What we used to do was that, you know, when somebody, you want to surprise somebody, the other kid, you say, hey, look up. There is some lizard or something is there. So this fellow looked up and I really got my hand released. <laughs> anyway, so now what we did was that we had a cabinet subcommittee which was chaired by Gujarat. And that made all the difference. So eventually when Air India was asked to do that, there was no problem. Air India didn't ask, hey, are, we going, are you going to pay us? How much will you pay us? Nothing. It was so smooth that uh, I used to get a phone call from a man, from the Air India manager, Manuel, whom you mentioned. And we had to keep our conversation very brief. So he used to say, good morning, 850. That meant 850 passengers were there and we had to send the aircraft. Again, I just lifted up the racks and Ganeshan was the civil aviation secretary. Good morning, sir, 850. Yes, Fabian. End of the conversation. I didn't have to discuss how many aircraft he was going to send, but I could always be sure that aircraft will go on time. No need to check up. Now, now the question is, how did it happen? Initially, there was, at some level, and let me mention that, Cabinet Secretary and Principal Secretary to the Prime Minister, when K.P. Unikrishnan uh, mentioned, you know, that we have to arrange for the evacuation, they raised the question of the cost. I mean, it was wrong. <laughs> There's no question of, you know, you can't discuss cost of people have to be. And it was then that K.P. Unikrishnan and Ganeshan very cleverly thought of uh, getting these grounded Airbus 320 aircraft back into operation because that's how it started. And once it started, of course, you can do many things. So that is how it happened. Uh, so, you know, even at the highest bureaucratic level, there was, uh, what shall I say, the unnecessary thought of how do we pay for it, you know, because external affairs regulations are very clear. If you are an Indian citizen stranded abroad, if you have a problem with your security, the government of India has to evacuate you. Now, Air India, of course, did a wonderful job, but I want to share something with you. Manuel once came to me when I was at the Aman Hotel, and it was sort of, uh, breakfast time, and he came with a very long face. So I asked him to have coffee. No, sir, no coffee. What happened? They walked out on me. Who? The crew, Air India crew. Why? Oh, they were waiting for the passengers for three hours, and uh, not all the passengers had come in. So they walked out saying that, you know, if they 
start the flight, then they will be on duty for so many hours beyond the stipulated time. So they walked out. And then this poor man had to find food, accommodation for all these people. So he said, I should speak to the crew. Now, I didn't have enough confidence to go to the crew, but I thought I will do something else. Firdas Kargamwala was in the Foreign Service, 67, 68 batch. Now, he was earlier with the Hindu. He got disenchanted with the Foreign Service, so he went back to the Hindu. And he was in Bahrain, covering the whole Gulf. So I called him, Firdaus. I wanted to carry a story about Air India. What's the story? Story is that Air India is doing its job magnificently. Here is a national crisis. Passengers come late, one hour late, two hours late, seven hours late, but doesn't matter. Air India crew is there to receive them with a smile. They may have to be on duty for 10 hours, 15 hours, 18 hours at a stretch. They couldn't care less. And we all have to learn from Air India, those of us in the government and outsiders also. So Firdaus said, Fabian, is it true? So I said, Firdaus, if you carry the story now, it will be true tomorrow. <laughs> he hummed and hoard. Then I said, let's solve the problem. You just uh, caught me verbatim. After all, you are entitled to believe a joint secretary of go to government of India. If you didn't double check, nobody can blame you. So he, he carried the story. And the next day, Manuel came to me with a big smile. Sir, no problem. What happened? Oh, there was a meeting of uh, the crew and the guild, I mean, uh, guild of pilots and all that in Mumbai. And they said that there was media praise for Air India. So there will be no problem. So it's good to praise people. Now, <coughs> I want to, have I got two more minutes? No, there's no time. There's no all right. Two but minutes. Anyway, go ahead. Two, two minutes I more. have no heart to stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, two minutes more. One is that, you know, I mean, you know, how it all worked with the missionary. The Kuwait was and Iraq were under sanctions and we had to send food. And uh, we got permission from the United Nations thanks to our PR uh, saying that, you know, we can send food. And uh, MV Merchant Vessel Paris Raman. So we contacted the uh, uh, Shipping Corporation of India and they said, uh, this ship is there at Kochi and they will wait there for 48 hours. If you can fill, the, fill it with food, it will go straight. I called the Chief Secretary in uh, uh, Tirvanandapuram told him that, can you fill it up? Yes. Then he asked me, what sort of food? I said, listen, half the people in Kuwait are from Kerala, so you think of what the Malayali is like, but don't forget the other half also. <laughs> Add whatever you think. And let me tell you, he did not ask me who will pay for it. I had to tell him, please, do me a favor, send me the bill once you have done it. Now, that was the coordination. You see, people trusted each other. Now, I sh I'm going to end by saying that something about water. When we were in Amman, uh, Uni Krishna and I, we went to uh, the camps. And uh, our people told them that uh, they were not getting enough bottled water. Why? Well, there was a shortage, but there was an additional reason. The Filipino ladies were able to smile better with the Jordanian, you know, security people. So they were getting all the bottles. <laughs> okay. I telephoned our ambassador. I don't find him here, but he was there. Ranjit Sethi, ambassador in Abu Dhabi. Had a chat. He said, uh, no problem. So he spoke to his wife. And she was the president of the Indian Women's Association. And I tell you, within hours, the water, bottle of, uh, bottles of water came. Because one phone call and somebody local. So that was it. Now, last. I think it is a good idea to have uh, history. Hmm? In fact, you know, it is, I don't know whether MEA has done one. Uh, MOD did a history of uh, the 1962 war, which was a disaster. Now, I don't see why we can't do a history of this evacuation, which was a, such a great success. Now, 
uh, we should do it, and uh, you have all the people concerned. They are still around, but don't wait for too long. So <laughs> either <laughs> the IIC can do it, or MEA can do it, or both can do it together. And thank you, Suhas, for thinking of it. But let me also say, Suhas did it because of the film. So we should thank the director of the film for bringing us together. And I was a frequent visitor at that time to Baghdad and Amman, all the way up to the war, three days before the war started, I was in Baghdad. Now, I, I really want to make three comments, very briefly. The first is, as a friendly observer who was not with the government of India, I would like to say that we in the United Nations were deeply impressed by the Indian professionals in the area. I myself was amazed at the way Kamal and his wife dealt with the influx to his own home and all along the embankments near his home in Baghdad. It was exceedingly moving. And the reputation of the Indian diplomatic corps at that time, amongst the others, was very high because of their empathy with those who were suffering and those who, whom they were having to handle. And our case too was about the heaviest, the heaviest. When I first went there, uh, Kofi accompanied me. He was then uh, junior to me. We went there together to help the, get the release of the foreigners whom Saddam Hussein had taken into captivity as human shields. Plus, we had hundreds and hundreds of UN personnel of the UN family. We wanted to extricate them, get them out. But I remember Kofi was particularly mindful of the fact that the burden on Ambassador Bakshi was immense. And he made it a point which I couldn't do, but he as a non-Indian could do, to speak frequently about the need for everyone to rally around the Indian ambassador in his efforts and all of the Indian people in the area who were engaged in the evacuation of 170,000 people. It was a huge effort. That's the first point I wanted to make, to say how greatly the efforts of the Indian ambassadors and Indian personnel in the area was appreciated. The second point I want to make is that I feel a little sad that the contemporary narrative is being discussed now. The contemporary narrative should have been discussed contemporaneously. And here I feel there's a problem with Government of India, forgive my saying so, but Government of India has a serious problem in telling its story contemporaneously. Uh, I think that <coughs> uh, what little I've seen of the UN, we have many faults, but one thing was we did have a Department of Public Information which tracks every major action of the UN, and particularly operations of the UN. The Security, stuff, security Council stuff is all recorded contemporaneously, but every operation is contemporaneously recorded. So you don't have to wake up 50 years later or 25 years later to say we did this, we didn't do this, and have all kinds of people distorting the record, which they so readily do because of a lack of knowledge, sometimes of a lack of discrimination, sometimes of stupidity, and sometimes of malice. We have to avoid that. So I would say my second comment is, let the Ministry of External Affairs devise a system for the contemporaneous recording of its major activities and operations. And I would hope that the experience of the Kuwait evacuations and now the efforts in Yemen are incorporated into our system, that our systems of readiness don't have to be devised each time a crisis arises. We can see what is happening. And we're living on the edge of an abyss every day as far as our compatriots are concerned in these areas. We do not know how they will face it if all hell were to break loose again in areas where they're in considerable, considerable number. These are the only three comments I wish to make, and thank you. Well, I'm Governor Mamek, retired. Of course, subsequently, lessons learned from this evacuation helped us in many more evacuations, which let, uh, continued thereafter. Uh, two points which I want to make was that uh, this Airbus 320, it, it was actually grounded because of a political tiff between Rajiv Gandhi and V.P. Singh. It, yes, and it was it, uh, the error which happened was a pilot error. It, because of the uh, poor flying of the uh, management of the cockpit. So it was not a uh, Airbus f failure, but it was made out to be, and there were flimsy grounds to ground it, so therefore they wanted an excuse to lift them up. So it came as a good excuse to lift them up. Uh, second point was that you, we had invested enough in the defense forces of Iraq. I have so many people, I had trained so many Iraqis, and 
we had always defense, we have trained Iraqi pilots, we trained Iraqi naval officers, we had everybody. Why we didn't use those defense attaches to go and get across and, you know, where access was limited? I will give one example. We, uh, we, had one, we had one Airbus grounded in Nigeria. And I had a defense attache from Nigeria. He was pulled out from Wellington at Staff College, sent to Nigeria because of his association with the Nigerian uh, uh, defense forces. And he was able to get that Air India uh, uh, Airbus, uh, you know, um, 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 released. So I'm saying when we have good investment in a place, we should use those resources in times of crisis no matter whether they are from external affairs or from defense. And we knew the everybody in, in the Iraqi Ministry of Defense had enough of liaison with it. They loved Indians. They loved, we taught them how to fly. We taught them everything. And whatever they would do in Kuwait, we would, we have, we would have taught them. Russians and Indians, they were the only people who taught them. So we had enough of, uh, you know, uh, I would say, leverage with the, uh, the Iraqi forces. We should have used them. I don't know uh, why we didn't use them. And of course, the third point was that one of the factors was that we uh, paid for, immediately we involved a Gulf cess. If you remember, for airlifting these people, we immediately put a Gulf cess. And at that time, the condition of government of India, as a foreign exchange was concerned, was, uh, I would say, uh, pits. It was down to $500 million. And Mr. Jaswan Singh and uh, was foreign minister at that time, immediately in 1991. They flew down to Germany and to Japan and asked for assistance to f to fill up the coffers. No, 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 not Jashwan Sina. Jashwan Sina. He, yeah, Jashwan Sina went to Japan and he asked, they gave him $500 million as, you know, he went, both of them went to Germany and Japan. So India was in doldrums at that time. We had long queues for petrol. If you re recollect 1990, we had long queues for petrol. So India was in a very bad state. Despite that, whatever we did, we would consider that this humanitarian lift we did was in a, from a position of great economic uh, crisis. Thank you. I um, uh, just clarify this point. <clears throat> you are absolutely right about the goodwill that we have created over the years with our Air Force, Army, and Navy training the Iraqis. This goodwill is a, is a palpable part of our living in Iraq. So you notice that because of, it is because of this goodwill that not not one Indian woman was badly treated in Iraq. Not one Indian died because of lack of medical attention. There was only one accident in which two people died. I could go on. So the, the goodwill that you just mentioned was actually there and it was used without being actually used and so on and so forth. Secondly, uh, Mr. Dayal has just gone, but I wanted to mention to you the way the government of India works. And he made a very good point that we should have all these records with us. Now, this was not my first crisis in, in Baghdad. This was my second crisis. I was consul general in Karachi during the 1971 conflict. And I was under house arrest for about three weeks, starting with the, the war. I had, I had kept a complete diary. I had written from the end of uh, uh, November to the, the whole through time through that I was there, what was happening to us, where were we, how did we behave, what, what happened, bombings and so on and so forth. I remember when we were repatriated to India, I took all this, all these diaries that I had to talk to the then uh, senior officer in, concerned in the Ministry of External Affairs and uh, I started talking about our experience. He didn't want to know. So I went and <laughs> young, I was young in 1971, I tore up those papers and I did not take, I loss, uh, no, I, but, and I did not take any notes this time because I thought it will be useless. Let me do this duty because that's my duty, but forget about the rest. I have just two small points to make. One is Air India put up those big hoardings of the biggest airlift in the world and they really made their point. And secondly, external affairs makes films on culture, art, for embassies and the show on Durdarshan. But there should be some films of this kind that, you know, that's a greater achievement. The difficulties were for foreign exchange. 
and in this operation, the only foreign exchange was fuel and putting up our people elsewhere. So I don't think that really mattered. The Gulf says. No, no, that we needed money. That's a different matter. But the point I'm making is, no, 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 that is, okay. But the point I'm making is that whether the government is short of cash or not, the people have to be evacuated. Point. That's it. <laughs> when uh, students uh, watch a film airlift, they may feel very impressed. We all know that that was not the truth. How do they come to know that actually there were distortions in the film? So my request is if you can make available, uh, you know, the discussion that happened here in the YouTube. So, so actually, you know, so that you know, we can certainly you know, provide this. That's the plan. Okay. Yeah. And as soon as possible. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, so we'll uh, close this uh, meeting. Thank you very much. And I think it's, uh, it's been a tremendous, uh, you know, record of oral history. And we'll carry this forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.